Hey, how are you all? My name is Kevin Navani, the Total Connector. I'm the host of the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. I'm really excited to have Thibault Marichal back on my show. He's written an excellent article on, uh, you know, uh, on the purchase of 21,554 Bitcoin by MicroStrategy, which is owned to uh, to approximately 20, uh, 25% owned by Vanguard and BlackRock. As you know, they are the biggest fund and wealth asset managers. And so the question is for me, you know, are CFOs, chief financial officers, senior management officials, decision makers, or also in other institutions now um, obliged or sort of in a breach maybe of their of the fiduciary duty, responsible due diligence, if they do not at least develop a capital allocation to Bitcoin? So are we already, you know, sort of a, at a tipping point to the to a real uh, institutional mass adoption? could take still some years but you know as Parker Lewis said gradually then suddenly so without further ado I'm really excited to go down the rabbit hole with Thibault, with Thib or Thibault Marichal and let me know if you have any questions pound that like button please subscribe to my channel and my YouTube channel my podcast platforms and write me anywhere a positive review on iTunes or wherever it would help me tremendously thank you so much again for your support and for listening Welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kevin Davani, also host of the Total Connector Show. Today is August 18th, 2020. Bitcoin is at around, um, what is it? Um, Thibault, welcome to the show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. It's good to be here. So, um, you know, uh, Tip, um, first of all, your article that you published is, if not, uh, I'm not sure how many, uh, I don't even know how many articles you've published, but I think you, because you haven't written, you had not written much or published before this article uh, um, on the on the blog site of noxcustody.com titled, um, is Bitcoin the world's reserve, uh, the, is Bitcoin the world's safest reserve asset? published right. on August 14, 2020. It's a brilliant article. I love your article. It's super concise and it's super beyond bullish. So <laughs> uh, maybe you want to break down a little bit, you know, the the essence of that article, um, because it's about the, uh, you know, the Nasdaq listed, um, what is it, the intelligence software company, uh, MicroStrategy. But what is more interesting to me is also the the, the 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 ownership structure, which is Vanguard and BlackRock, which is you know in the macro investing uh, sphere or space is is super like well known, because they are like uh, what are they like I guess uh, super fund wealth management uh, institution, um, managing uh, trillions of dollars right of assets. Right, right. So the title of our episode, I I, I chose that title deliberately because I think that's the key to 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 a chain reaction of of institutional mass adoption um i i chose the title fiduciary responsibility or fiduciary um duty to develop um capital allocation to bitcoin um so my question i think uh, would then be i'm going to talk about this later on but my sort of my question is when would when would the time come where uh, CFOs or what they call whether whatever they called chief financial officers or you know in that rank senior management officials decision makers in that league would be actually in a breach of um, fiduciary duty or responsibility due diligence not to at least develop a capital allocation to Bitcoin or plan. Or at least allocate, or literally not not allocate a certain percentage of their cash reserves um, uh, cash reserves into Bitcoin. All right, it's your stage. Thanks so much for coming. Right. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, it's really good to be here. I mean, there's a lot to unpack in that news. I guess the reason why uh, I wanted to write this article is because there's been a little bit of news coverage around around this release but there wasn't really anything when it came to actually like what it meant for for bitcoin and for other companies that are listed on public markets and so i thought look if i'm asking myself these questions i'm pretty sure a whole bunch of other people are thinking the same thing are trying to 
you know, research the space and trying to understand like what it actually means for, for these two things. And so, uh, yeah, that's how it came about really. It was uh, out of pure curiosity. It was, uh, it was an exploration, another rabbit hole uh, that I, uh, I guess, uh, did a did deep dive into uh, following this news. And, you know, while I'm far from uh, an expert in uh, treasury and corporate, you know, uh, fund management, uh, definitely it, there's a lot to, uh, there was a lot to discover there. And th I think there's a, quite a bit of uh, learnings for a bunch of other CFOs and fiduciaries who are managing these types of holdings. Um, now saying that today it is a breach of fiduciary duty to, you know, not have an allocation uh, into Bitcoin is perhaps a bit of a stretch. And maybe it was sort of a, sort of a, a teasing kind of hook that I wanted to include in that, in that article. It's, it's a narrative that is crafted, but definitely, you know, if you look at CFOs and other executives in charge of, of managing treasury for these listed funds, um, it seems obvious today that they should actually know of Bitcoin and actually have done a little bit of research and due diligence when it comes to understanding the properties of Bitcoin, like what makes Bitcoin cash what makes Bitcoin perhaps the best cash in the next decade or so uh, being again, resistant to, uh, to inflation and, and uh, devaluation. And so, yeah, I mean, if you look today at the role of, of treasury managers, they do allocate to a bunch of different asset classes. Uh, and these of course uh, include, you know, bonds or other foreign uh, exchange markets uh, and so on. And so, I mean, again, like from a risk reward standpoint, um, Bitcoin seems to be quite a, you know, quite an obvious bet for me personally. But again, it's because I've, I've been lucky to be in the space uh, and, and I've done my research. But so again, like having a little bit extra documentation and literature out, outside of our own eco chamber, I think will benefit a whole bunch of other, uh, other, you know, executives. At least I hope that's the goal, right? We all, uh, we all win there getting uh getting a better money for our companies and then of course like if you think in terms of all the repercussions of having an allocation into bitcoin when you're managing a treasury um it's massive right because if you start let's say allocating not as microstrategy did like a 50 percent but if you start allocating 10 percent of your excess cash reserves uh and then that 10 percent becomes 50% in five years and I'm being conservative. We both know that, or maybe I'm not, but anyway, the number go up technology will definitely, you know, force managers to think through what it means to not hold Bitcoin. And I think this opportunity cost will, will come, you know, pretty, pretty strong at these, uh, at these people who've been ignoring it for the last, for the last decade. Uh, and you look at, again, I think uh, Andy Yi uh, from uh, Visa posted this great tweet speaking about the uh, career risk and the fact that this risk for both hedge funds and now CFOs have been nullified or substantially reduced with the announcement of MicroStrategy and, you know, investing such a massive allocation and also uh, Paul Tudor Jones uh, allocating, you know, one, two percent of his portfolio. So what we're seeing, um, I guess, uh, an institutional adoption, I think not the one that we expected at first, like thinking that family offices would start, you know, preserving their wealth in, in massive amounts in, in Bitcoin. And even though I personally do believe that this time will come, it seems like the first institutional adoption comes from corporate treasury, at least the public one that we've heard of recently. And Indirectly, interestingly enough, it comes from other really large wealth and fund managers, the likes of, again, BlackRock and, uh, and Fidelity and um, um, Vanguard, who are allocated into you know, the equity and the cap table of MicroStrategy. Like MicroStrategy's cap table, I think, is 97% uh, institutional funds. It's over 400 funds that have equity in that company. And so now all these funds, even though they're not holding physical BTC, they do have price exposure to Bitcoin via MicroStrategy's balance sheet. 
And so again, it's going to be fascinating to watch like what happens to the stock price of MicroStrategy over the last over the next let's say twelve to twenty four months as you know we enter the bull bull market and uh, Bitcoin price goes up. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, you know MicroStrategy's price stock price should also go up, uh, and that is not going to be a function of their earnings necessarily or you know their their top line and i think preston pish was mentioning this on a podcast with uh, stefan levera um and so again what what happens to uh valuation models right because if the stock price of micro strategy goes up by 10x over the next 24 months because bitcoin's price is going up 10x uh then the pe ratio of this company is going to go through the roof as well and so of course you know other competitors will will notice but then what happens to the the valuation models that all these funds that do have exposure to micro strategy like what are they going to be doing with those those new numbers um, does it mean that the company is is overpriced um, because these are all unrealized gains right and until they sell like it's just going to sit on their balance sheet as as a as a as an asset that is uh, that has a, a massive unrealized gain, and so anyway, all of these questions I think are are fascinating, and I really don't have answers to all of them, but I think it's as the first step, it's really interesting to uh, to start uh, asking ourselves these questions and start thinking about what it means as a as a community and as the little eco chamber that we are on Bitcoin Twitter. Yeah, the you know the um, the analysis or the statements um, 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 that, are, that have been given by uh, uh, the CEO, what's his name, uh, Sailor of of MicroStrategy. Michael Sailor. Yeah, and and their team. I mean, it's really remarkable. Uh, and you've you've quoted it, you know, in 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 uh, pretty lengthy in your article. Anyone, I should recommend to to read the article itself. So um, you you mentioned before that, um, and you quoted, I think, Andy Yee, Senior Director of Public Policy at Visa. He said that the uh, MicroStrategy move effectively removed career risk for CFOs from putting company treasury into Bitcoin. So that should be sort of my transition uh, to my next question is that, you know, there's like um, I don't know how many global pension funds. Uh, there, you know, pension funds uh, globally. It's forecasted that they're, they're going to reach approximately sixty trillion dollars in 2025, from previous forty-two trillion dollars in 2018, growing at a five point four percent compound annual rate, boosted also by Latin American assets. Blah blah blah, and so. Do you see pension funds coming into this game because now uh, because they have to consider, you know, the macroeconomic development, you know, the, 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 the insane central banking printing of money, uh, the, 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 the over leveraging of debt. So, um, you know, the whole the whole insolvency crisis that is about to come also in the European Union. I mean, you know, the, sort of uh, from from the much bigger perspective, do you think uh, the CFOs have to are now forced to consider all these factors, parameters, and are playing. Um... Yeah, it's a it's an interesting question when it comes to CFOs and uh, sorry pension funds. I, I wanted to say and and then uh, you know the allocators that are responsible to to manage these holdings. I mean, I, they're more risk averse, right? Because they're retirement funds that are deploying capital for you know really long-term horizons i think sometimes it's 20 40 years uh type of capital allocation strategies and so even though i'm a big bitcoin bull uh i think it's going to take a little bit more time for these types of fiduciaries to to decide to make material allocations into bitcoin but again i may be i may be wrong here but just looking at the uh risk appetite of of these managers it seems like it's uh they they're going to be the one of the laggards, laggards when it comes to actually investing in Bitcoin. Um, though again, if you look at their main allocations today, pension funds are mandated to invest in material amounts of bonds and fixed income, which today have been pretty uh, bad at returning uh, yield. And also another part of their mandate 
is to hit specific targets when it comes to return. And so again, like you can hit a certain nominal rate, but with upcoming inflation and all that, your real returns are going to be pretty, pretty low as a, a manager of a, of a pension fund. And so again, I wonder where these, uh, these capital allocators will, will deploy uh, their, their dry powder in the coming years. Um, so Bitcoin is definitely a, a, a saver for, for these types of funds long-term. Um, and this is why I wrote another, this headline in the article, like fiduciaries need Bitcoin. And again, if I think that is true, if their mandate do not change, and they are still required to hit those real rate of returns that approximate, you know, five, six, seven percent. Um, then, you know, good luck finding that in traditional asset classes. Um, and again, it's, uh, it's all a matter of building those uh, risk adjusted returns that do make sense in terms of volatility uh, for these, again, like long term uh, funds, but it Again, because they're focused long term, uh, they shouldn't be too sensitive to Bitcoin's short term up and down volatility. If they're buying those those allocations for the next uh, twenty years, you know. I mean, one could argue. Uh, it's interesting what you're saying. Um, 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 you know, it's it's it, one could argue that two hundred fifty million dollars for for let's say for the owners. Um, uh, for the ownership structure of of micro strategy is really nothing. It's like a drop on a hot stone. So it's uh, and it's what um, those whatever twenty five thousand um, or how much how many how much Bitcoin was that twenty one or twenty five thousand Bitcoin? Yeah, twenty one thousand Bitcoin roughly. Mm -hmm. So what is zero that, like, one percent. Yeah. Of the total supply. Yeah. So and we are at the mac market capitalization of Bitcoin at two hundred fifty billion. Yeah right now yeah. so you know i mean it shows us how early we are still <laughs> so um so if they're you know you're thinking of you know not only family offices pension funds global pension funds who's sitting like of, of of on 50 60 trillion of dollars wealth and fund management um that's nothing so could it, do you do you foresee like a sort of a do you think that's a quiet before the storm like sort of a it's a gradual is rather like according to Parker Lewis is sort of a real gradual and then and then it all comes suddenly in five years, 10 years. Yeah, I mean, just uh, I just looked up the number, but on for pension funds, roughly the total assets under management for these funds is eight point six trillion dollars. And that's only for pension funds, right? You look at uh, corporate treasury right now only on the balance sheet of the top 100 companies that are traded uh, in the Nasdaq, they hold over like around a trillion dollars worth of cash, right? And cash equivalents. That's only for, you know, top 100 and it's only for Nasdaq. And again, it, it appears that the, the next bull run could be partially led by corporate, uh, you know, debt financing. Right, because again, there's such low interest rates that are uh, instilled by central banks to stimulate the economy that these companies essentially with their balance sheet that they can leverage can acquire substantial amounts of liquidity and cash and just deploy these these reserves on, into Bitcoin. Um, and that I think again, that may very well happen because they're going to have a few benchmarks in the marketplace. And the first one being MicroStrategy, right? They opened the gate, the gate, the floodgate is open now. They're going to be like, if I wrote this little article, I'm pretty sure there's a whole bunch of other analysts on Wall Street that are looking at that company and they will definitely monitor the, how the evolution of, of, of this position and how the stock price of MicroStrategy behaves. And so, if you think of just the operators that are also looking at that, because again, Michael Saylor being the CEO of a listed company, you know, they, they're pretty close together, all these executives and CEOs. And so they talk, right? So definitely like a lot of other operators, I'm pretty sure are, I've been, I've heard of this, or perhaps thinking about this, they're perhaps building their internal theses and, and investment strategies. Uh, and they're, 
they perhaps even already deployed and we don't even know it because they haven't done a, a press mm -hmm. release yet, right? Because <laughs> one of their board members isn't really comfortable with the decision yet or something, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. who, who knows, right? I'm, I'm totally speculating here, but it's a, it's an interesting narrative to follow. And, uh, and so, yeah, if you start looking at the potential corporate FOMO that will uh, unfold in the coming months, it could be, could be interesting. And, you know, we had this, um, um, these discussions on, on Twitter about whether or not the fiat speculative attack would come from consumer credit. So people like you and I just taking on loans and, and buying more Bitcoin with this, essentially destroying the, the value of fiat over time. Um, this may very well happen from, from corporates instead first, right? Um, and then, you know, what happens when, you, when you're a, a fiduciary managing large amounts of capital on behalf of other investors, you're going to see the price of Bitcoin go up. You're going to see all these corporate balance sheets super strengthened and, uh, and, you know, liquid also. Um, at some point, you know, as a, as a fund, you're going to have to, uh, to step in and, and actually allocate your capital to that asset. So to Parker Lewis point, uh, gradually, then, then suddenly, right, we may, uh, we may get a uh, quite a bit of a FOMO in the next cycle. But I, I still don't believe that hyper Bitcoinization is going to happen before three or four cycles, but we shall see. Yeah, but the market capitalization of Bitcoin could reach easily like a trillion dollars by in the next few years. I mean, that's Really, I mean, when you look at the hyperinflationary tendencies unfolding, when you just look at the central bank and monetary policies, and all the experts saying, you know, also in the European Union, Europe, that there we have a huge insolvency crisis. The banks are insolvent, and uh, and you know now even you know the ECB, as you know, as Draghi said in when was it in March, whatever it takes. So. <laughs> So, you know, we, we, we just just zoom zoom out and look at the bigger picture. What choice do all these institutions have than to allocate into Bitcoin? I'm, I'm okay, yeah, they can allocate to gold or whatever, or productive capital, you know, um, stocks, real estate. I mean, what choice do they have? That's my question. Yeah, definitely. I mean, again, from uh, trying to be as objective as possible and looking at the, the properties that Bitcoin have as a as a money uh it definitely is the best uh the, the best sort of set of uh of parameters right in terms of soundness of money and so again that's why it, it comes back to this point that we made earlier fiduciaries will have to make will have to do extensive due diligence and if they don't do that they may be just sitting on their laurels and, and that again is uh, is a breach of their responsibility. And so they may have to actually do the hard work. And when it comes to researching Bitcoin, it still is uh, quite a tough, it's the learning curve is steep, but the, the amount of literature and, and just reading and great books and podcasts that there are out there is is growing extremely rapidly and i mean it's improved the uh, 10x or you know over the last few years over the last two three years we're super lucky so and we're all contributing to that you know um so i guess at some point it's gonna be it's gonna be tough to be in finance if you haven't heard of bitcoin and you don't actually understand it let's put it this way yeah and it shows a degree of of ignorance by now i think if you haven't heard or, or, or at least, you know, uh, understood the, the, the fundamentals of Bitcoin, right? Right. Yeah. And then if you look at incentives, I guess, some like traditional, whether it's asset managers or, or banks, they don't necessarily have a, an incentive to actually see Bitcoin rise to be a successful monetary asset um, because Bitcoin as this, you know, massive uh, gravitational pool of, of capital will definitely at some point uh, lead to uh, deflation in, in other asset classes as investors divest from these asset classes. If you look at, you know, whether it's real estate or just the stock market or gold, 
um, all these asset classes are, they do have accrued uh, monetary premium over the last few years because our fiat currencies are super bad at holding value. And so, yeah, definitely if you see, if you start seeing Bitcoin rise, most of these positions will divest. And so you're going to see deflation in those asset classes, which is not necessarily desirable for, for all these um, entities that are allocated quite substantially to these, uh, to these asset classes. So again, I think it's still better to be able to adopt Bitcoin because you choose so, not because you're, you have to, you must, but at some point it's going to be a must for people. And, and if they don't do the switch in a, in a timely manner, um, they're going to get wrecked. Uh, and that again, this ignorance is uh, is going to be uh, is going to be pretty costly for for fund managers. It'll be interesting to see once um, Bitcoin um, is is you know is considered as a denominator. Uh, I mean, you've also uh, uh, talked about this in your article, where uh, all kinds of um, you know currencies or whatever or gold is um, indexed to Bitcoin. There's this graph I'm just showing on the screen um, on your article. Right. So, do you think <laughs> that there'll be something, huh? If if you know if Bitcoin all of a sudden is the denominator, because right. that's the real peg, you know, that's the only real um, a sound peg that one could you know uh, compare with. Right. Yeah, I mean, if if you look at any asset class actually compared to bitcoin it's gone down over the last mm -hmm. 10 years substantially right you look at this graph from uh unchained capital's blog it's from parker lewis gradually then suddenly uh, series and yeah it's uh from 2014 to 2019 it seems like the dollar the euro the yen and gold are totally going to zero uh, it's, it's a an abrupt fall um, and that is true for real estate. That is true for the, you know, the S and P 500. And so again, um, you can't be asleep at the wheel and not take notice as someone who's responsible to, to manage capital. Um, now, of course, there's not only return, right? And you have to consider risk adjusted return as as a fiduciary managing capital responsibly. And so, but again, adding a uh, one, two to 5% allocation to your portfolio of, uh, you know, 60, 40 stocks and bonds, it, it's been proven to, to reduce uh, your sharp ratio, you know, the, the overall volatility of your portfolio. And also the, uh, I think the, the max variance on uh, the downward trend when it comes to, uh, to, uh, to losing value in your portfolio. So again, these are all uh, really in important aspects of wealth management to consider, and Bitcoin definitely will will be part of that uh, equation in the in the coming decade. Now, there's no no turning back. When it comes to uh, Bitcoin as a as a numeraire, which is again what Preston Pitch Preston Pitch um, described with Stefan Levera in another episode. Um, I wonder when. This is going to happen like at what market cap if it's uh you know if it's going to be the you know the i guess psychological mark of a, a trillion dollars uh, or if it's going to be the uh, total sum of you know us dollars that is actually in circulation plus us treasuries which i think is roughly 30 trillion um but what's interesting is that bitcoin is already a unit of account for for some of us, right? I personally price my life in sats. And so anytime I wanna make a, a big purchase, not like bread or groceries, like that. that is, I guess, not 100%. I'm not doing it religiously yet, maybe I will. But when it comes to bigger purchases at over $200, I'm definitely thinking in sats. I'm like, okay, am I comfortable like just getting rid of that today? Is it gonna be worth that much in five years? 10 years. Um, so definitely, uh, again, it happens on an individual level, right? But at some point, because everybody does it, including individuals and corporates, uh, then everybody does it, right? And so when that happens, is uh, still, uh, 
TBD. <laughs> you wrote also in your last um, paragraph in your article about the stock to flow ratio. Now, there seems to be sort of a, I don't want to call it controversial, but sort of a dispute, debate about, you know, the the real, um, I don't know, what do you call it, the, um, the implications of, or is it, like, is it real? Is the stock to flow ratio or or could we even, I don't know, consider it as an ex post confirmation thing? Because you know it's hard. You know it's getting harder and harder, of course. It's yeah. with an absolute scarcity. So, of course, people, the more people understand, comprehend the real fundamentals of Bitcoin, it is foreseeable, of course, that people are going to buy into it because it is absolutely scarce. I don't know. How do you, how do you see the, this whole this so called controvert discussion going on with the stock to flow ratio? Yeah, there's a lot of uh, controversy in that regards. I believe that predictive modeling on such a complex matter that is human action is a very Keynesian thing to do. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's pretty hard to understand how the collective human uh, kind will actually price Bitcoin. No, I guess it's a very, personally, I find it a really interesting uh, model to understand the past for sure and to speculate on the future. But I don't think people should hold it religiously as, uh, as you know, the you know, be all type of model. Um, again, models are by default wrong, right? And so it's sort of a good proxy to to make sense of the world around us, but it's not something that is uh 100 comprehensive um so yeah i mean that that would be my uh my comment on that it's uh overall predicting the future is uh is impossible and so uh i just read it from uh from afar and i'm, I'm pretty excited to see that sure bitcoin price evolution seems to be following roughly the the stock to flow model uh but you know, um, is it going to be 100% co-integrated over the next decade? To me, it, it seems quite unlikely because the model doesn't price in inflation. And so it assumes that inflation, actually the, the value of fiat currency, which is in that case, the US dollar is going to stay constant, but it's not. And so if you look, you know, again, I wrote in my article the the, ba the the balance sheet of the Fed over the over three months during the COVID outbreak and the hysteric response, uh, it blew up by seventy two percent. So that's just the total, like it's a new wave of money that's been injected into the economy. It's been inflating the stock market, which you know that's how we got our quote unquote V shape recovery there but that money at some point is going to flow downward into the economy and uh and it's going to you know decrease the individual unit of value for the dollar and so that is not taken into account in uh, plan b stock to flow model so at some point the model basically is bound to fail is bound to break when hyper bitcoinization happens or hyperinflation happens, right? Because because it would exceed actually even the expectation of the prediction of the model. I mean, then it, yeah. you could actually say, then we could actually say, you know, the 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 logarithmic function is actually exponential, way more exponential. This is what I also said to Plan B once. I said, you know, what if it just you know surpasses every other expectation? Because uh, I mean, for me, it's logical because you have to, con you know, you have to uh, um, calculate or consider every every parameter. I mean, uh, with its FOMO, greed, it's the you know increasing exponential hardness of of Bitcoin, the scarcity, the the difficulty adjustment, the halvings every four years, the macro, uh, you know, the macro uh, um, investment uh, um, uh, conditions going on, you know, like like micro strategy and like coming in, all these big institutions coming in that would accelerate actually the process so then it would be sort of a you know check mark you know oh we we knew you knew you know, sort of we knew it uh, we knew that it's going to happen right and i think 
to again what, what plan b mentioned in, in his latest uh update on the model it was that 99.5 percent of the model is is actually like the r square between the stock to flow model and the spot price of bitcoin over time is has a correlation of 99.5 which means that there's only 0.5 percent of external events which influence bitcoin's price if that's the case then yeah you sort of leave a little bit of room for a micro strategy for a you know a ban or for a bunch of other external unpredicted events and the rest like honey badger doesn't care um, we, uh, we we shall see how how this happens <laughs> so uh, and then uh, staying in that last paragraph still, um, I really loved your last sentence um, or your la the last sentences you wrote. You said, once Bitcoin gets adopted by most companies, a global and sustained deflationary future may await us, allowing responsible capital allocators to invest soundly accumulated capital for truly productive uses as popularized by Jeff Booth, author of The Price Tomorrow, whom we had actually with together with Titus Gable. Uh, on the show just recently on my show. So, uh, did you read his book? Um, <laughs> it's uh, it's here. Okay, I just got it. Okay, I gotcha. just got it. Okay, it was okay. my opening. It was like I'm gonna I'm gonna you know sneakily inject that reference in the end, and uh, it'll force me to read it. <laughs> now you're gonna love it. I, I read it I think three times because also as a preparation for the interview, I also read Titus Gable. The two that's why I, I you know I really had the desire to bring them together. I thought, oh my God, you know, this is a, a beautiful fusion of, you know, free private cities, whatever you call it, Bitcoin citadels and, and you know, self-sovereign cities with deflationary economics, uh, uh, zero to one technologies, a Bitcoin standard, <laughs> you know, and everything else around it. So this this was sort of a vision that I had with, with uh, after reading two, those two books and that's why, you know, I call my, uh, Stephanie von Jan called the discussion because I dropped off and off. It was just terrible. My internet connection got lost with thunder, rainstorm, and then the, in the electricity went off. It was really crazy at that day. Anyway, so, um, uh, yeah, you're going to love it. You're going to, I think you're really going uh, to, I'd, I'd really love to, to do like a, um, a, con a continuation of this talk, maybe uh, in the near future with you. Um, you know, what's your thoughts uh, on, on deflationary economics and, 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 you know, as Jeff Booth says, it's inevitable. It's, you know, it's coming like a gravity and central banks government are, are, are totally in a, uh, you know, totally uh, schizophrenic state of mind. You know, they are like, you know, the, the government central banks are totally like, you know, doing inflationary uh, monetary policies and everything else, you know, ruining everything. And, and then you've got the deflationary technology. So these well, are two opposite is, Yeah, we, we sort of experience it every day, right? With technology already. Like everyone has experienced it and everyone loves it because you get more as things, as, as we get better at producing stuff. It's phenomenal. I mean, why, why would anyone be against deflation? And I think exactly. that's the, yeah. it's uh, a, <laughs> that's the, the mania of central banking and Keynesianism, like assuming that things like prices should go up and we should have a stable, <laughs> arbitrary rate of inflation. Um, I, I find that fascinating that they sort of like legitimize this school of thought and that everybody now takes it for granted. Uh, it, there's a fun parallel to be made here with uh, between central banking and, and Ethereum, right? It's sort of a, it's so complex that <laughs> nobody really cares what happens. <laughs> It's obfuscating uh, complexity, you know, did exactly. American HODL say that or something like that? I'm, I'm not sure yet. So. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, and so nobody, you know, is, I guess, comfortable asking questions because they feel too dumb to ask the questions. And that's true for central banking and Ethereum as well. And that's how, I guess, uh, a side note, that's how Pierre Rochard a few uh, days ago on Twitter with uh, Bitstein uh, created the supply gate because uh, no one had actually asked how to uh, verify this supply of Ethereum. Central banking. At some point, people are going to ask, okay, so like, why do we actually need that 2% inflation? Like, you know, or what the fuck happened in 1971? Like I'm seeing all these graphs like go nuts after this year. And so, yeah, again, um, when everybody starts asking those questions and realize that there's no 
legitimate answer. Um, individually, you fall down the rabbit hole, but at some point you're gonna, you know, trying to escape that uh, paradigm and, and shift to another one. And uh, usually that one is uh, is big one. So, do you have the impression that there's an exponential learning curve taking place right now, or is it not really? like rooted in mainstream yet? I mean, or do you think people are asking themselves at least some kind of questions, some kind of, you know, legitimate questions, like what the fuck is going on? Again, personally, I can, I can speak about these, uh, these experiences recently. I've had, I've had a few friends who actually decided to buy Bitcoin, um, wow. regularly or like one lump sum of, you know, 500 bucks or something. And yeah, it's because they've seen the, uh, the, um, immense amount of money that was created out of nowhere and even though they don't have the details about where that money went they're like yeah but you know if all that money is created then why bother pay taxes or why bother you know work five days a week eight hours a day right and so they're like okay there's there's something weird going on there like people feel that there's uh, that something is not straight and uh, yeah, again, like my, my generation, right, were millennials in, let's say, you know, mid 20s to mid 30s. And I mean, real estate is overpriced. Today, getting a loan is pretty, pretty hard, if not impossible in the current environment. Um, stock markets, so you need to be really good and understand the, the companies and the industries in which you're investing. Otherwise, it's pretty... Like it's a, it's a gamble. Uh, gold, like who buys that as a, as a millennial, right? Uh, so again, like you're you're left with uh, not that many options and bonds, like same thing. So so Bitcoin is definitely a, a really compelling asset because you can buy a fraction of it. There's no speculation at all if you understand the properties and the long term uh, horizon that you need to take. Um, and I think that the narrative as that emerged uh, in terms of savings is also pretty compelling. Um, I feel like millennials do save more than boomers. Um, you know, I, I have a few friends or, or, you know, friends of my parents who are boomers and they consume a lot. They've usually, they were lucky to acquire a home at cheap price, cheap prices. And, uh, and yeah, they just consume and spend. It's not really uh in the mentality to save, whereas our generation millennials, I feel we do save a bit more. For Bitcoin, Maybe the Atlantic, boomers uh, are more of a spoiled generation, you think, because of their spoiled generation, because they've, they've, they've sort of enjoyed, you know, the asset uh, inflation, you know, it's, it's an asset inflation still going on, right? Right. Probably it's a combination of both, yeah. The asset inflation and, and the fact that they're pretty comfortable with the uh, welfare state. Mm -hmm. Especially in France and Europe, it's uh, you know it's pretty common to uh, to have uh, quite a dominant state when it comes to support, when it comes to uh, retirements. Like yeah. here in France, for instance, like all French people are waiting on their retirement funds. Mm -hmm. um, especially in France, there's this very strange system where you pay for the retirements of people who are uh, retired at the moment, and mm -hmm. when you go and hit your retirement funds, actually younger people are gonna be paying for your retirement. So it's kind of a, it's literally a, a Ponzi scheme. Um, so I think boomers are gonna start the, uh, to see the beginning of the shaking of that Ponzi scheme. But I know for almost a fact now, if you do, just do quick math that the uh, retirement funds uh, when it comes to maturity and when I'm supposed to go and, and retire, let's say in, you know, 40 years, uh, I'll probably never see that money again. Um, no, so again, you gotta, you gotta think about alternatives. You gotta think about private capitalization. Yeah. I mean, I'm not counting on any pension fund. They're all, I think they're all insolvent. I mean, look at the United States, even, I mean, the, all the, in, uh, the uncovered funds and, and, and uncovered liabilities, um, you know, and that you you know that's why the the, the total um, global debt is not it's not two hundred fifty billion. It's actually uh, whatever two point one quadrillion because you have to count in all the uncovered liabilities and derivatives, right. of course. Yeah. Um, so 
you know, since you are at Knox custody and you, you, you somehow you, you touch upon this, like, how do, how does MicroStrategy now, um, uh, you know, secure their, these Bitcoin? Are they, are they already insured or how do they secure them? Right. Yeah. It's, uh, so it's something, uh, I saw in their, on their SEC filing because they're a publicly listed company, they do have to disclose all the risks that emanate from their activity, which is again, super interesting from that standpoint. So yeah, if you look at their filing, they're disclosing that unmitigated risk of key management, right? Saying that they rely on, uh, on different custodians to hold their funds, their Bitcoin holdings but that the, you know, the insurance policy may not cover them in case of, uh, of a loss or a theft. So, you know, I quote, like, while we hold the bulk of our BTC assets with established cryptocurrency custodians, a successful security breach or cyber attack could result in a partial or total loss of our BTC assets in a manner that may not be covered by insurance or indemnity provisions of our custody agreements with those custodians. So, Again, it, it, it's fascinating because uh, here the goal was not to shill Knox uh, shamelessly, I guess, in the article, but really was to ask this question, like, how do they actually custody uh, mm-hmm. and should uh, a micro strategy or any other listed company uh, hold their own keys in uh, multi-sig forums uh, of keys, such as Unchained Capital, for instance, mm-hmm. Or, or should they rely, or if they have to rely on custodial services like Knox or, or Fidelity Digital Assets, uh, should these custodians be fully insured? Mm-hmm. And of course, I, you know, I do believe, and we do believe at Knox that if you're going to be using a custodial service, it should come with 100% insurance on the value that is held. Ideally, the physical Bitcoin, right? But these policies today do not exist. So what I mean by that is when we say value that we hold, like getting 100% on that is because our insurance today prices the holdings in U.S. dollars. And if there's a claim event, we can reimburse, you know, up to 100% of mm-hmm. that value in dollars. Mm-hmm. But if the price of Bitcoin, you know, moves during that claim and settlement period, uh, you may not be made 100% whole on the on the physical Bitcoin. Though we do believe again that over time, this, uh, these types of vehicles will will become more sophisticated. And hopefully, you know, we may be able to get uh, close, if not, you know, actually, uh, physically uh, true when it comes to settlement of these uh, of these insurance policies. So yeah, it seems that MicroStrategy is using a, a mix of custodians, and they're they're not they're not insured uh, to cover these uh, these uh, edge case scenarios. So not at all. They're not insured at all. I mean, not, not if they get like if get, if so. Get if you look at if you look at the the big uh, custodians, right? I'm not gonna sort of like name names particularly in terms of their policies and like their risk level, but you know the Bitgos, the the Fidelities, the Coinbases of the world. Um, let's say one of these custodians claimed to have a hundred million dollar insurance policy. When you look at an insurance policy, you got to look at two things, the, the breadth of coverage and then the depth of that coverage. So the breadth is really the type of risks that are transferred and essentially covered as part of the policy. Most of these custodians usually have vault risk, which is physical penetration of vaults that guard keys or backups of those keys. And if someone actually breaks into those vaults uh, and and triggers a loss, then the custodian is covered. But usually that's not enough, right? You're going to need collusion insurance. You're needing operators of that custodian deciding to steal funds should also be covered. Um, you're going to need some cyber attack, uh, you know, insurance coverage. Like there's a whole bunch of other risks that you need to take into account. And once you've covered that breadth, uh, that base, uh, you should build the capacity to actually transfer the amount of risk that emanates from, from these categories. And so that can be $10 million, $100 million, $1 billion. The point is, if you have, let's say, $100 million of insurance policy, but you hold 
a billion, then you're actually quote unquote double spending that policy on, on your customers. And if there's a loss that affects all your customers and your custodian is, you know, has lost the Bitcoin holdings, uh, that custodian may actually only be insured at 10% because they have a hundred million dollar policy on a billion dollar holding. And so, you know, again, we believe that this is a, this can be a, an acceptable risk if it's properly disclosed and understood by, by consumers and, and other market participants. Um, but otherwise, you know, we do believe that because it is possible and we've done it at Knox, like you should, you should demand a, a one, one insurance policy, meaning that if you have $250 million of, of holdings and you're a listed company, you should demand $250 million of insurance coverage. Um, and so these policies are hard to come by. Uh, they're usually, you know, very expensive uh, or they're just pretty scarce uh, because again, it takes, takes a lot of work uh, to build a system that is, you know, secure enough and correct in its security to be able to, to give comfort to insurance markets that it's a risk worth uh, covering uh, on their books. Fascinating. So, Dib, um, to wrap this up, um, what do you think is going to change or fundamentally change the, you know, the, the critical adoption rate, the price of Bitcoin? Do you think that Lightning or Jack Muller's, you know, easy user friendly applications uh, are going to, you know, fundamentally shift, you know, uh, cause a shift uh, in the ecosystem in Bitcoin's ecosystem? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, Bitcoin is still a great it's a great savings vehicle. Uh, I'm really excited about the open source multi-sig uh, products that are being released. So of course, you know, Unchained's Caravan is, is amazing. Uh, but one that I came up, uh, that I've discovered recently, which was published pretty, pretty recently is Lily Wallet. Uh, I haven't tried it yet, but I really wanna, you know, work on it and, and test it uh, because it seems to, uh, to meet a lot of, uh, a lot of pain points that I personally had when it come, when it came to multi-sig. Um, so again, that's just making multi-sig way easier. Uh, I think it's going to be substantially bullish for, for Bitcoin as people withdraw from exchanges and, uh, and into their own wallets. Um, and then all the DCA services um, is uh, it's a fascinating movement to see because all these services are essentially creating a, a massive, uh, you know, sustainable demand for Bitcoin. And so it just creates uh, that hodler base, reinforces it. And because uh, usually it, it's like a subscription service, right? Usually when you set it up, you just forget about it. If you put 20 bucks a month, uh, you're just going to be stacking. And whether or not you remember it, it it's, it's happening. So mm. uh, yeah, these two things I think are pretty bullish. Um, and yeah, I'm also curious to see more, uh, full nodes, uh, being, being developed more options there would be great. Uh, but more so more than that would be the, um, the actual education behind full nodes, like really helping, uh, noobs understand why that is that they should be running a full node. Uh, it's almost like as an early adopter, you shouldn't be able to, to see your Bitcoin and your wallet unless you're running your own node right yeah like wallets should actually add that in the interface or something they should say hey you know we're you're using a trusted node i may be lying to you right now you may actually not have bitcoins you should buy a node and set it up uh, so anyway uh yeah pretty uh pretty excited about these things very exciting very exciting so um yeah why don't you tell me uh, tell my listeners where they can find you or any other are, are you are you planning to write more articles in the near future yeah definitely it's uh i've i may have a uh, shy of like 10 articles in draft <laughs> <laughs> you know uh so yeah definitely uh, i want to write more don't want to commit to anything i think it's just better to uh, not talk about it and just publish when when uh when there's value publishing 
Um, so yeah, definitely I enjoy writing. It's a, it's a really good moment to, uh, you know, do a deep dive on a, on a subject and, uh, and to clarify thoughts. So we'll definitely do more of that. And if people like them, great. Um, and then, uh, yeah, people can find me on Twitter. Um, DMs are open. It's uh, T-H-I-B-M underscore. Uh, always uh, love to speak about Bitcoin, meat, economics, uh, and uh, yeah, philosophy and, and a whole bunch of other topics. So hit me up there. Definitely. That, it was really, uh, ex it's really excellent article um, tip. Um, the Bitcoin as the reserve asset as the, what's the title again? Sorry. Is Bitcoin, it's the, Bitcoin world's the world's safest, safest reserve asset? Yeah. Right. That's right on blog.noxcustody.com just going to put it in the show notes so yeah any other uh, final thoughts closing thoughts for the future for the foreseeable future do you see anything what, what's your vision i think it's the next time we see a uh, bitcoin under 12k <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one and uh yeah i mean uh strap on for the next uh 12 months all righty well Hope to have you back on soon, um, maybe on a panel discussion. I'd love to, uh, you know, hear your thoughts. Maybe co-moderate also with with Stephanie because she's in also the economies. I think she has a lot of questions for you, and maybe get you together. Who would be your like your? Uh, who would be a guest whom you could, you know, whom you would say this, you know, would be really exciting discussion. Like as a co oh, co, co guest. So many so many uh bitcoiners <laughs> on twitter just take the list of people i follow and i would be humbled to uh to speak with any uh, any one of them fair uh, enough now yeah. when it comes to uh to uh i guess institutional adoption of bitcoin i'd be curious to speak about that with uh someone from more of a traditional markets uh angle right someone who's had the experience yeah, uh, I was thinking of Lynn career. Alden. I was thinking of Lynn Alden. What do you think about? Her? And she's really oh, yeah. amazing. Lynn is, uh, knowledge. She's amazing. She's yeah. like a super brain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, it's phenomenal to uh, to see uh, Lynn's work on on Bitcoin and, uh, and just the macro analysis that that she does. It's uh, it's brilliant. I you know, highly encourage people to uh, follow her if uh, they're not already. All right. So that's about it. Thanks so much, Tip, and talk to you soon. Thanks, Kevin. All right. What you guys think? I really enjoyed this talk, as always, with Thibaut Marichal or Tib. Um, make sure you f you follow him on Twitter. It's t h i b m underscore. And read his article on blog dot dot com. You can follow him on Twitter. Also, Nux Custody on Twitter. And uh, yeah, the article is really excellent. It's really a super thorough, concise analysis. Is Bitcoin the world's safest reserve, um, the world's safest reserve asset? So please uh, pound the like button, um, subscribe to my YouTube channel, to my podcast platforms. Please leave, leave me a positive review. My, my email and GMs are open. My email address is hello at the total .com or kd at kvondavani.com. Um, Make sure you follow me on LinkedIn, Telegram, Facebook if you want, but on Twitter, LinkedIn, and also my website is kvandavani.com or thetotalconnector.com. If you want to support my work uh, in monetary wise, you can still support me with Fiat and or Satoshis. The, the links are in the show notes and yeah. Make sure um, the I think mass not you know mass institu you know m uh, the institutional mass adoption is coming the critical adoption rate is coming uh, with all the shit that's going on right now unfolding uh, the, the you know the criminal activities by central banks governments the lockdowns the uh, central bank printing of money in trillions and trillions and uh, inflation hyperinflation uh, stagflation unemployment insolvencies it's you know it's a shit storm it's i think it's the quiet before the storm my name is kevin davani i'm the total connector and let me know your questions your suggestions your wishes desires for the next episodes and thanks so much for your support bye